Good afternoon, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and I want to start doing some um, webcasting here, some, some YouTube videos uh, for our church's YouTube channel. I'll probably post these on the, my other channel too, just to, because we need to do this, and uh, I really miss my congregation. And it's looking like with this um, coronavirus and uh, the seriousness of it that we may not be, um, be able to all get together. Uh, for a while. Uh, right now the plan is to do a kind of have a, a skeleton crew here. I think that uh, we'll probably be able to have at least one pianist uh, to come help lead in singing and you, you will be finding out why uh, they turn my microphone off when we sing um, hymns. <clears throat> so what we'll do that on Sundays we'll live stream um, but it's just it's painful. It's, it's just you know growing up um, my father um, did not put up with nothing. I mean, I tried everything to try to get out of going to church when I was a teenager because I, I wasn't a very godly teenager and tried everything. Dad, I'm so tired. Oh, the, you know, I've been working like a dog all week long. Dad, I'm all beat up from, from football or basketball or practice or whatever. And it was, um, I won't tell you what he said, but um, there was no question I was getting up and going to church. So you just didn't miss church. We did not miss church. Uh, and my family uh, growing up, and so it's just weird, especially now that I'm a pastor, and I pre I uh, prepared two sermons, and um, I, I intend to preach those sermons, uh, but it's it's really a strange thing. It's a, a, a process I've, I've gone through. You know, you go through your studying, and then you 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 pray, and you study, and you write, and you do your reading, and um, by the time you you've done your spade work throughout the week, you've got you know a message that you wanna you wanna preach, and it's it's just coming out your pores, you know. And so Sunday we had to make that call, and it was a, it was a difficult thing um, because we want to be good stewards. We want to be uh, wise. We don't want to put people in danger, and um, hopefully this won't last very long. Um, but we're going to have to do it this way. But I've been encouraged uh, by the by our elders and by one of our deacons that I need to do some videos just so um, I have some kind of of interaction. Well, actually not interaction, but. Um, I'm able to speak to the congregation, and uh, I, I'm so blessed to be able to preach to such a great group of, of people, um, of Christian brothers and sisters, and they've been um, very uh, loving towards me and my family, and uh, I've appreciated them uh, so much. And um, we, we certainly live in uh, strange times, and you know, with, with everything going on in the world, with all of the revolutionary ideas that are sweeping through our culture, which are trying their best to sweep through the church too, uh, so that there's no church left um, if it if they are successful, um, we we want to still uh, focus upon the Word of God and we want to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and we want to focus on what's true and good and beautiful. We want to look at what Scripture teaches us. We want to look at the gospel. We want to look at the the wonderful and glorious things that God has revealed to us in His holy Word, the Bible. So that's what we're going to do. Um, whenever there's a crisis like this, uh, whenever there's a, a big issue. Um, a health crisis, you know, a, a, a viral pand pandemic or, or whatever you want to call this, um, what, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to stay focused on, on God. We're supposed to stay focused on the Lord Jesus. And so it's very important that we, that we do that and that we focus on what is true. We focus on, on what God has shown us in his holy word. So that's what we're going to do. And what I'd like to do in these videos, I'm going to try to, I'm going to be pretty ambitious. I'm going to try to do one of these, um, four times a week um, while this is going on, um, while this this issue of the coronavirus is making it so that it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, for the whole church to get together on the Lord's Day. I want to do a study, a detailed study, of the doctrines of grace, um, the doctrines of God's sovereign grace, as they were enunciated by the Synod of Dort uh, back in 1618, 1619, um, and look at the uh, scores and scores of biblical texts and we're going to do that um, in great detail using bible works and um, i have finally figured out how to use this camera and how to get it rigged up so i can do cool things like this let me show you here i just figured this out a little bit ago boom there's the cans of dort and i've got the uh, a pdf of all the reformed confessions and they're very nicely formatted and um you know kindle books are kind of hit and miss if they're not formatted well they can be a real pain this is nicely edited and very easy to navigate, and I've, I've, I've made the font bigger so that you could read it on the screen without having to look things up. And also, uh, not just look at the canons of the Synod of Dort, but we're also going to look at the biblical text as well. And uh, where's Bible Works? Hello, where is it? Why is that? There it is. 
So here's BibleWorks. This is BibleWorks 8.0. I've been using this for a very long time. And we'll be looking at, at text of scripture. I want to just real quick give you, just try to give you an idea of what exactly it is that you're looking at here. Um, NAU stands for the New American Standard Update. That's what we use as our um, the text of scripture that we read from and preach from. Underneath it is the New King James Version right there. And usually I'll display one verse at a time. Then there's the ESV and the King James Version and the LXT. I don't need... The LXT is actually the Greek Septuagint version. I'm not going to need that, probably. Um, and then there's uh, the uh, what's called Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. That's the, uh, the uh, Hebrew text of the Old Testament. But when we look at, for example, like things in the New Testament... Um, hello? Oh, I'm sorry. It's got me trying to... Let me put the New American Standard. Okay, Galatians 3, 12. Okay, here's uh, Galatians, and you see it displayed in four different English translations. You know, there's the New American Standard, the New King James, the ESV, the KJV. Those are the ones that are primarily used by the, the folks that I preach to. I've always read from, or have not always, but have read for a long time from the New, New King James. And then down here, just real quick, just so you know what you're looking at. Um, this is the BNT, stands for the, um, the critical text. That's the, the text that's underneath uh, the ESV, the New American Standard. BYZ stands for Byzantine text. That's the Textus Receptus. That's what's underneath the King James Version, the New King James. And the reason that uh, the term anthropos, that, that Greek word right here that's is highlighted green, is I have a little module turned on that will highlight textual variants for me. So on, in any given verse that I look at, I can see immediately if there is anything, if there's a difference between um, the critical text and the um, Byzantine text, between, the, for example, the New American Standard and the uh, King James Version. And it's really cool because BibleWorks is really useful. And you can just go verse by verse by verse. Notice most verses don't have uh, textual variants, or they, they're very minor. They're usually just spelling differences. You see, there's the, the, the preposition akri. Um, has a sigma, this one has a sigma on the end of it. This one does not. Um, and you don't need to know that. You don't need to know Greek to be able to, to understand what we're doing here. Uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of what it is you're looking at. This little area right here, this is all the resources. This is like all the, the Greek and Hebrew dictionaries. and everything. There's tons of stuff you can do in this. My, my main issue here, what I want to be able to do in, the, in this series, is pull up biblical text. And primarily, we're just going to read here from the, the top. You know, I'll, I'll just be walking you through this and, and looking at what those texts say. If there's anything in the, in the Greek text, occasionally I might bring that up, but you don't need to know Greek to understand the Bible or to, to benefit from this study. So anyway, I also wanted to point out three books I'm going to be making use of, too. The first one is, um, here, let me change back to the main screen here, is this one. Five Points of Calvinism by um, Thomas and Steele and Lance Quinn. It's kind of a new one. This was printed as a much smaller book years ago. I had, I had dozens of copies of that. They've expanded it to have a bunch of essays and stuff, in it, and they're all really good. Uh, but what this is primarily, this is it's just a compilation of biblical texts. So after we go through um, each of the canons of Dort, remember there's five main headings, the, the T-U-L-I-P, although... As you're going to see, the, canon, the actual canons of Dort themselves are written as U-L-T-I-P. So it's ULTIP instead of TULIP. And I still remember the first time I read the canons of Dort, I, I was expecting it to start with the T, with total depravity. And it doesn't. It starts with, with um, unconditional election. So I quickly learned it's actually not TULIP in the document. It's ULTIP, U-L-T-I-P. So that, that is the order we're going to go through it because I want to look at, um, whoops, I want to look at, the canons of Dort, and I have to change this here to point at it, which is this. There it is. So we're going to look at the canons of Dort um, and uh, go through that uh, together and study it. And so the Five Points of Calvinism uh, by Steele, Thomas, and Quinn. Great, great paperback. I'm glad it was expanded. It's got some good stuff in it. Also, another book I want to, to point out is this one, Grace Worth Fighting For. Uh, Recapturing the Vision of God's Grace in the Canons of Dort by Daniel Hyde. This is a, is a pretty thick book. I have this on Kindle as well. And it's a detailed study of the um, articles of the Synod of Dort. And I was very glad to see this. I was hoping that you know people would realize we, we just had the 400th anniversary in 2019 of the Synod of Dort. And the other one was by Robert Godfrey. I'm glad that Godfrey has finally started writing more books, Saving the Reformation. Uh, the Pastoral Theology of the Canons of Dort. Let me make it so you can actually see it the, without the glare. Saving the Reformation, the Pastoral Theology of the Canons of Dort by W. Robert Godfrey. I believe he's still the president of, um, uh, yeah, of Westminster Seminary in California. So those, those books, and I've got this on Kindle as well, and I've read, uh, read a little bit of it. Um, really good stuff. Saving the Reformation. No, notice the titles of the books. Saving the Reformation, the Pastoral Theology of the Canons of Dort. I just want to point out, the Reformed Confessions 
are warmly pastoral. There's nothing that animated my evangelistic zeal and my zeal to pray and to worship and study more than the doctrines of Scripture. And the, the doctrines of Scripture are summarized brilliantly in the Reformed Confessions. Um, and one of those great Reformed symbols is the canons of the Synod of Dort. Now, that's typically that, that's part of the, the continental Reformed tradition where they have the Belgic Confession, which is, out, which is wonderful, a wonderful, great confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the canons of Dort. In fact, I visited a Christian Reformed church many years ago before we um, started attending a, a Presbyterian church. And in the back of all their hymnals, you had the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort. And it was really great. Kind of like we have the, um, the Westminster Confession and the Shorter Catechism uh, in the back of their Red Trinity hymnal. They would have this in the back of, of their hymnals, the, the Christian Reformed Church did. And I, I believe the uh, United Reformed Church does too. So these are great, great, great doctrinal statements. And I, what, what had been taught to me about the doctrines of grace, um, to, also known as Calvinism, um, had pretty much been wrong. Um, I had never heard uh, a defense of why Reformed people believe what they did until I read the cans of the Synod of Dort. And I've recommended that people read them a lot. They're not very long. You could read, you could read the cans of Dort in a couple of hours. Okay, it's not very long. Um, and it's very well thought out, and it's excellent stuff, and it's warmly pastoral. But I want you to notice, um, notice again here. Saving the Reformation. Grace worth fighting for. What, what was this all about? What was the, the, the synod addressing? Well, it was addressing a giant step backwards towards Rome. You see, when Calvin and Luther um, first enunciated their positions, and then you have the, the codification of those things into the great Reformation confessions, they are solidly um, hardcore unconditional electing grace. They, they recognize that for salvation to truly be by grace alone, you have to have unconditional election. If, unconditional, if you lose the doctrine of unconditional election, you cannot argue for sola gratia. You can't argue for grace alone anymore. You could say grace is necessary. You could say grace you couldn't be saved without it, but it's not sufficient by itself. It's not the grace of God alone that saves sinners it would be something else it would be the grace of god makes salvation possible if men will use their free will to avail themselves of this that or the other thing or the grace of god is preemptorily applied equally to everyone to get them out of a state of bondage to a bondage to sin into some kind of neutral area that makes it possible for them to cast the decisive vote um, or to do the decisive thing in their own salvation the, re the reformers, the churches in the Netherlands, they saw the five points of Arminianism, that what they were wanting to be revised, which they answered in the five points of the Synod of Dort, they recognized this is a step back to Romanism. This is a step back towards the Pelagian and the semi-Pelagian theology that locates the decisive factor in salvation, not in God's sovereign election, but rather something that we do independently of God. Whether you say grace is necessary prior or not is irrelevant. If you say the decisive factor is in, is in the sinner independently of God, even if he does it with God's help, but something he does in some way independent of God, you cannot argue for sola gratia. And so Godfrey wrote his book, Saving the Reformation. Because they could see, if we go this direction of the Arminian remonstrance, of the Arminian protestations here, if we adopt their proposed revisions of our confessions, then the Reformation has been lost. The Reformation is gone. The Reformation is over. Um, so Saving the Reformation is what Godfrey called his book, great title. And then Daniel Hyde's book, Grace Worth Fighting For. And it is. It is worth fighting for. And every generation of Christians needs to be willing to fight for true sovereign grace. In fact, the doctrine of justification by faith alone is consistent only with unconditional electing grace. It's consistent only with unconditional electing grace. Uh, because as Paul says, as we're going to figure, let me, let me uh, use this little module here to figure, to show you this. As we're going to see uh, at some point here, Romans 4, 15, I'm going to pull up, pull it up in browse mode. So we're just looking at the, the biblical text here. And I need to switch this to actually point at it. There we go. There it is. Okay, this is Romans chapter 4, verse 15. You see it there? For the law, for the law brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there is no violation. For this reason, 
it is by faith. You see, see what he's arguing here, what he's pointing out is, the law of God is of no use to you when it comes to getting into heaven and being right with God. The law cannot help you. Why can the law not help you? Look at verse 15. The law brings about what? Wrath. Wrath. But where there is no law, there is no violation or no transgression. For this reason, for this reason, it, what is it? Justification. It is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. We're justified before God by belief in Christ alone. We trust in the righteousness of someone else to get us into heaven and to make us right with God so that salvation will be by grace alone. Because if our justification is by something in addition to faith, something alongside of faith, it's not grace anymore. It's not grace anymore. In order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed. You hear that? If justification is by faith in Christ alone, and not by our good works, and not by church attendance, or baptism, or participation in the Lord's Son, if it's by, by believing the gospel alone, and not by anything in us, not by any subjective transformation in us, that is in accordance with grace, and that's what makes our salvation guaranteed. That's what makes it guaranteed. That term, babayas, the Greek term, babayas, firm and secure. Why is it that when someone who really understands the biblical doctrine of grace and the, the biblical gospel will say with the utmost confidence, that they, they will say with confidence that I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven. Um, why is that not presumption? Why is that not sinful? Because it is recognizing that the whole of our salvation is in Jesus Christ. So that the promise would be guaranteed to all the, the descendants or all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, meaning Jews, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, Gentiles. Verse 17, as it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist, in hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which has been spoken, so shall your descendants be. It's an amazing uh, use of Genesis 15. That phrase, so shall your descendants be, that's what God said to Abram when he took him outside and said, look at the stars and count them if, if indeed you can. So shall your descendants be. That's talking about every elect person that will ever be saved, Jew or Gentile, until the end of time. So justification is by faith, and not by works. And there's no such doc there's no such thing as future salvation or final salvation or future justification or final justification. No such thing as either one of those things. If you say that there's two justification if you say that there's an initial justification and a final justification, what you just did is you made the first justification not really justification. If it really is justification, the the need for a second one's totally redundant. If God has declared me righteous before his law on the grounds of the righteousness of Christ, what need is there for a future justification? Um, I, I learned that this past week. I was reading Archibald Alexander, um, Archibald Alexander's book on justification. He said to, to say that there's a future justification um, is to render the first one uh, null and void, to say that it wasn't justification at all. It's a great argument. He's exactly right. So justification is by faith so that it will be in accordance with grace. And from our perspective, arguing biblically, it is justification by sovereign grace. Sovereign grace. Okay, so saving the Reformation, that's what the Canons of Dort were all about. These Arminian protestations came forward, and they, they got together, and it was a crisis, and they answered it, and they did so in a brilliant fashion. So I want to go through and try to get through um, the first article here, um, or at least a good part of it. If not, I'll just put a bookmark in here. I, I, hopefully, I'm going to try to keep these uh, right at the one-hour timestamp. But the Canons of Dort, because I, I feel the need to talk to my congregation um, I really missed everybody this past Sunday. It's just not, it just feels so wrong um, not to be together on the Lord's Day, especially since we don't, we don't like all live in the same village where we can all hang out together. We see each other on Sundays, you know, and that's when we get to, we get to fellowship. And um, it's always such a, um, a great privilege of mine uh, to be able to, uh, to preach to such a fine uh, group of, of Christian people whom I, I love dearly. The Canons of Dort. The decision of the Synod of Dort on the five main points of doctrine in dispute in the Netherlands. The first main point of doctrine, divine election. I'll use my little pointer here so you can kind of see where I am. 
The judgment concerning divine predestination, which the Synod declares to be in agreement with the word of God and accepted till now in the Reformed churches set forth in several articles. I want to point out here, Article 1, this rocked my world the first time I read it, like 20 years ago. I mean, I, I was not prepared for this. Um, but looking at these passages that they cite here, I thought, wow, that's that, I never thought of that before. Article number one, God's right to condemn all people. Since all people have sinned in Adam and have become under the sentence of the curse and eternal death, God would have done no one an injustice if it had been his will to leave the entire human race in sin and under the curse and to condemn them on account of their sin. As the apostle says, the whole world is liable to the condemnation of God, Romans 3.19. All have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death. See, being an American and growing up in American Christianity um, and thinking that democracy is the lens through which we should read everything in life, including the Bible, I thought, no, 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 Every, everyone is equal and is entitled to a shot, at least, at being saved. And I was even open to the idea that maybe um, if a person dies and has never heard the gospel, God will give them one more chance uh, before they're, they're sent off into hell um, to repent and believe in Jesus. But what I was not recognizing and what I was not taking seriously is what scripture teaches about what the fall did to mankind. The fall rendered humanity enslaved to sin, loving sin, and hating God. And so if God was going to allow um, us to get fairness, well, fairness is everybody goes to hell. And nobody is going to choose to believe in Jesus because nobody has the desire to do so. No one has the desire to let go of sin and follow Christ. And that's why um, our old theologians, the Puritans, and of course just going from what the scripture said as we're going to see here, um, the Bible teaches that man is, is incapacitated. He is not able to repent. He's not able to repent because he has no desire to do so. You know, the great Jonathan Edwards um, in uh, his works makes a very important distinction between natural ability and moral ability. And what Edwards says, uh, that's a really helpful distinction, is that human beings have the natural capacity to obey the law of God. The problem is, after the fall, we don't have the moral ability to do it because we don't want to do it. We don't want to do it. We don't want to follow Christ. We don't want to do what is righteous. We want to sin. We want idolatry. We want false religion. We want beliefs and ideas that are going to confirm us in our arrogance uh, to thinking that, yeah, we could use some help from God, but we are the decisive factors in our own salvation, if we even believe that we need salvation. And that's what the fall did to us. The fall incapacitated us so that we we will not come to christ we will not repent because we don't want to we want to do the will of our father the devil john 8 uh, 44 uh, jesus said that i mean jesus uh did not care about offending people i think he offended people my um my eight-year-old daughter uh, asked me uh, two days ago uh, she said do you think jesus ever hurt people's feelings <laughs> When he said things like that, we've been reading through the Gospel of Mark, and I can't remember what, what we read. She, she raised her hand. Daddy, do you think that Jesus ever hurt people's feelings? I said, yeah, I think so. Probably a lot. Pretty often. If someone was broken, though, if someone was repentant for their sin, he was as warm and as welcoming and as pastoral and gracious as possible. But to the pompous and the arrogant, to people who refused to own their sin and repent of it, um, he, he hurt people's feelings. Uh, look here at, uh, at John uh, 8, 44. Um, you are of your father, the devil. This is Jesus arguing with his opponents, uh, his Jewish opponents at the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, John chapter 7 through 10. And he tells them, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Look at verse 45. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Isn't that an amazing thing? He says, the reason, the cause of your hatred of me is because I tell you the truth. Who are the most popular people in Israel? throughout the Old Testament. Who are the most popular people? The false prophets. 
false prophets who told people, peace, peace, you're fine. Everything's hunky-dory happy. Peace, peace. Everything's great. No need to repent. And who are the ones that the people despised? And I mean murdered and killed and per persecuted. The prophets. The prophets that told them the truth. The prophets that spoke the truth to them. They were hated because they told the truth. And so this is the condition of every human being. Apart from the irresistible, effectual call of God, this is all of us. We want to do the desires of our father, the devil. And people find solace in false religion all the time. In pseudo forms of Christianity that will affirm them in their sin. That will allow them to think that no, I'm not, we're not that bad. And yeah, we, 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 got, we got grace through baptism. And now we haven't done anything definitively wrong. We haven't done anything that's going to land us in hell. That is not a biblical doctrine of, of human depravity. Man is a slave of sin. Jesus said that earlier in the same chapter in John 8, 32. Um, <clears throat> he said in verse 31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my, in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. In verse 33, then they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. You see that? So, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So, God has the right, God has the right to condemn the entire human race. To condemn the entire human race. And here it is. <clears throat> Article number one. Article number two, under the heading of unconditional election. The manifestation of God's love. Okay, so, so justice, God's right, is to condemn all people. He can throw everyone in hell and nobody can object. God would not be doing a single thing that was unfair if he just cast everybody into hell. That would violate nothing about justice. Nothing at all. For you and I and every other human being that would ever be born in Adam's rebellious and sinful race were just sent off to hell Nothing about justice would be violated if God had done that. So, uh, so, so often people think of unconditional election. Oh, that's just terrible. I thought, that, I thought that God was a loving God. It's unconditional election that shows his love. The article number two, you see it? The manifestation of God's love. But this is how God showed his love. He sent his only begotten son into the world so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And there, of course, is the allusion uh, to John 3.16. I want to look at uh, John 3.16 here, because uh, this is one of the most, um, most often misused verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world. What that, that, the term that's used there, it means in this manner God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. And that, that phrase that's used there means... Everyone believing in him would not perish. There's particularity even there. It's not that, that no one should perish, but only those who believe. Only those that are believing. The, the phrase mean, actually says, in order that, this, this right here, in order that every believing one, that is a, what's called a substantival participle, every believing one in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Every believing one, and only the believing ones. The ones that don't believe will perish in their sins. But the manifestation of God's love is that he sent his son uh, into the world so that everyone that believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. I lost the screen there for a minute. So let's get back to the canons here. Canons of Dort. Article number three. The preaching of the gospel. In order that people may be brought to faith. You know, that, that there will be people who are believing. God mercifully sends proclaimers of this very joyful message to the people he wishes and at the time he wishes. By this ministry, people are called to repentance and faith in Christ crucified. And there he recites, the, the uh, Synod cites Romans 10, 14 and 15. For how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without someone preaching? And how shall they preach unless they have been sent? Okay, Article number four. A twofold response to the gospel. 
God's anger remains on those who do not believe this gospel. But those who do accept it and embrace Jesus the Savior with a true and living faith are delivered through him from God's anger and from destruction and receive the gift of eternal life. Okay, so right now it hasn't even really gotten so much into the doctrine of unconditional election or divine predestination. Here they're laying the groundwork for it. God has the right to condemn and to discard the entire human race. Every single human being on earth deserves to go to hell for everything that we've done and for the fact that we are, we are willfully sinful. Willfully sinful. We do what we know is wrong. A lot. And that's everybody. That's everybody. God has the right to condemn the whole human race. But he, you see the love of God. You see the love of God and that he sends the gospel. He sends Jesus into the world and then he sends ministers out into the world to preach this gospel. Um, article number five. The sources of unbelief and faith. Critical point here. The cause or blame for this unbelief as well as for all other sins is not at all in God but in man. Faith in Jesus Christ, however, and salvation through him is a free gift of God. As scripture says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. Likewise, it has been freely given to you to believe in Christ. That's an important passage here. Let's look at, at that one, Philippians 1.29. Uh, Philippians um, one twenty nine. For to you it has been granted, on Christ, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. And so, to believe in Christ and to suffer for Him are both gifts of Christ to His people. Okay, faith in Jesus, belief in the gospel, is not something that originates in us. It's not something that originates in us. That's why the synod here points out it, it wants people to understand. Contrary to what the Arminians were saying, the Arminians were saying faith is our independent contribution. Yes, God makes it possible through his prevenient grace, but ultimately it's not irresistible. And so there's something that we have to do to make it work, to, to drum up faith within ourselves. And what the Synod is saying is that faith is not something that, that is in us. It is a gift of God. Faith is a gift of God. We have been saved by grace through faith, and that not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. I want to look at that passage too, Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, in Norm Geisler's really, really bad book called Chosen But Free, he tries to say that, well, because this this uh, um, noun right here, hutos, or, or tuta, that the form of it here, is neuter, and there's in it uh, pistis, the, the word for faith, is feminine, Therefore, th when it says, and that not of yourselves, it can't be referring to faith because faith is, is uh, feminine. <clears throat> the point, the, the answer to that is actually quite simple. Um, there's actually nothing feminine in the previous part of the verse here. So if you're going to use that argument, you'd have to say that um, the, the pronoun, the demonstrative pronoun that, tuta, that's used there, doesn't have an antecedent at all. And yet the neuter use here is simply a way of wrapping up everything that comes before it in the verse here. So, and when it says, and that not of yourselves here, grace and salvation, been saved, and faith, all of those things are the gift of God. That not of yourselves. You see it there? And that not of yourselves, that's a neuter pronoun, but it wraps up everything, grace, salvation, and faith, and it's a common construction in Greek. The, the neuter demonstrative wraps up everything that comes before it, and that not of yourselves. What, what is that referring to? Grace, salvation, and belief. Faith. It is the gift of God. Not of works, says verse 9. Verse 9. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So that no one may boast. And then verse 10, very important too. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So does a Christian do good works? Yep. Are they saved by him? Nope. Well, how do you know that? Because it says we're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. Now, in case someone would hear that and go, oh, cool, we can just sin all we want. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
that God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Will a Christian walk in good works? Yes. Are they saved by them? No. How do we know that? Because we're saved by grace through faith, not by works, lest anyone should boast. It's very emphatic here. Okay? Uk ex ergon. Not of works. And there you have hena metis calcasitai. In order that no one might boast. Or actually, with hena, when it has a subjunctive, is that, yeah, it is a subjunctive. It's in order that no one would boast. <laughs> not might boast, but that no one would. And we are saved by grace through faith. Not, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not from works, in order that no one would boast. Because we've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, we're not saved by them. Okay, I emphasize that a lot because there's, there seems to be a lot of confusion about that in, in these days. So what are the sources of, of belief and unbelief? What are the sources of belief and unbelief? I didn't bring up Bible works on that one. Okay, oh well. <clears throat> I was looking at Ephesians uh, 2 uh, and uh, Philippians 1. Okay, so what are the sources of belief and unbelief? It's um, faith in Christ is a gift of God. Okay? It's not something that um, man can drum up in himself. And as you see in the first sentence here, the cause or blame for unbelief is not in God but man. Okay? So it's not that God has to make sure men don't believe it because they really want to. The fact is none of them do want to. God has to do a special work of grace, an irresistible work of grace in his elect people to bring about faith in them. And that's what protects the grace of God. That's what the canons of Dort are all about. Saving the grace of God. Protecting the grace of God from the intrusion of human merit and salvation. Okay, article number six. God's eternal decision. God's eternal decision. The fact that some receive from God the gift of faith within time and that others do not stems from his eternal decision. Okay? So stop here just for a minute. What is the difference between someone that comes to know Christ and someone that doesn't? Why, why, do, why is it that one person repents and believes and is justified, adopted into God's family, and walks with the Lord throughout their lives and go on, goes on to heaven when they die to be with God forever? It is because God chose them. God chose them. Look at the next sentence here. For all his works are known to God from all eternity. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at this uh, passage here. Um, Acts uh, 15, verse 18. <clears throat> okay, let's look at, uh, um, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Here, let's see, let's look at... Um, in the New King James here. So that the rest of mankind, mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Now this is, um, I believe this is uh, James talking at uh, the Jerusalem Council, or Peter, one of them. <clears throat> and then verse 17. So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. And then verse 18. I'm sorry, it's verse 18. Known to God from eternity are all his works. And then they cite from Ephesians 1.11. Also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. And there you have that term, um, the term praorizo. Praorizo is the, the word for predestined. This is actually every occurrence of it in the New Testament here. This is where you see the word praorizo. Praorizo means predestined. What does predestined refer to? It means to determine beforehand. God predestined his people to adoption. You look at uh, the other usage of it here in um, Ephesians 1.5. We've been predestined to adoption. You see that there? He predestined us to adoption. And so that God determined our destiny uh, beforehand. Praise his holy name. He did that. His altogether loving and gracious predestining of those who did not want him and wanted nothing to do with him and would have spat in his face all the way to hell. God chose to predestine us to adoption. Isn't that wonderful? It always breaks my heart to hear people complain about God's mercy. That's not fair. That's, that's terrible. How dare you think that God would do that? The only reason anyone's going to heaven is because he did this. If God didn't predestine people to adoption, there would be no children of God. None. If he doesn't do this, if he does not irresistibly call us, if he doesn't elect us and give us to Christ before the foundation of the world, we're not going to heaven. Because we would have no desire to turn from sin 
and to, to love and know God. We just wouldn't. We'd have no interest in that. And so it's, a, it's an amazing thing um, that God would show such incredible love to us and patience towards us. Okay, so picking back up here where we left off. In accordance with this decision, he graciously softens the hearts, however hard, of his chosen ones and inclines them to believe. But by his just judgment, he leaves in their wickedness and hardness of heart those who have not been chosen. People immediately think, that's not fair. But remember, what does Article 1, what did Article 1 say? What does God have the right to do? To condemn the whole human race. Why? Because we're all sinful. And we don't want to, we don't want to know God. We don't want anything to do with God. We want to go our own way. We want to sin. We want our autonomy. We want to do what we want to do. We want to identify ourselves as whatever we think we are. Instead of going to the word of God and saying, God, I submit to you. You tell me who I am. You tell me what I'm supposed to do. Okay, picking up with the quotation here. And in this especially is disclosed to us his, uh, his act, unfathomable and as merciful as it is just, of distinguishing between people equally lost. You see that? We're all equally damned. We start off equally lost. See, the eyes of American democracy makes us go, no, everyone is equal and should get a shot at it. But the biblical starting point is everybody's already damned. Everyone's already lost. Everyone's already going to hell. And no one has any desire to repent. We love our sin. We love our sin. In this culture that we live in today, I mean, this culture revels in everything that is vile and disgusting and wants, and wants it to be celebrated and wants it to be illegal to even tell them to repent of their first love, which is sin. But listen to that sentence again. Remember, that's why uh, Godfrey called his um, book Saving the Reformation. You see the subtitle there? The Pastoral Theology of the Canons of Dort? This is heartwarming stuff. Listen to that sentence again. And in this, especially, is disclosed to us his act, unfathomable and as merciful as it is just, of distinguishing between people equally lost. Not equally worthy but equally lost. This is the well-known decision of election and reprobation revealed in God's word. This decision, the wicked, impure, and unstable distort to their own ruin, but it provides holy and godly souls with comfort beyond words. <laughs> I'm going to highlight that one. That gets a red highlight. That's one of the things I like about Kindle is that once it's highlighted here, it's highlighted on my phone and all my other gadgets that have my Kindle books on it. What a great sentence. This decision, the wicked, impure and unstable, distort to their own ruin. The fact that God chooses who he's going to save and bypasses the rest. He chooses to show mercy to some among a vast multitude of people, all of whom are equally lost, equally dead in their sins, equally hellbound, equally enslaved. To depravity and rebellion against God. And I, I still remember reading Romans 9 over and over and over again. And just being so irritated <laughs> that God is actually God. That verse, Romans 9, 18. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Wow. As it is written, I still, still remember it, the, the quotation from Moses when, when God uh, causes his, his goodness to pass by him in the cleft of the rock. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I remember it hitting me then. Everyone needs mercy and compassion. Who gets mercy and compassion? The ones that God wills to show it to. Because we're equally undeserving. Equally lost. Equally have a title to nothing but damnation and hell. Look at that. Let's let's pull this up here and look at it real quick. That passage, it was one of those two by four moments upside the head. Romans 9, 18. Let's pull up the browse mode here. Um, no, no, no. Okay, NAU. Romans 9, 18. So then he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he and and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, as I did, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? That's not fair. On the contrary, who are you, O oh man, 
who answers back to God. The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? Does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honor honorable use and another for common use? Wow. Look back at verse 17. See it here? Verse 17 right here. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up. By the way, Moses said that in Pharaoh's face. I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout all the earth. Look back at verse 15. Here, That's what I was quoting earlier. God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. Who's going to heaven? Who is going to be saved? Not the people who use their free will to choose it. It's God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. God says, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And then verse 16 Here's another, another difficult verse for the other side. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. So then, it does not depend on the man willing or the man running, but on God who has mercy. Wow. That's humbling stuff, isn't it? To know that that's the case. The only reason I have any interest in God, the only reason I want to follow Jesus, the only reason I know the gospel and I believe it and I detest when people twist and distort it and depart from it is because God chose to have mercy on me. I still remember that moment. I slammed my Bible shut and pushed it across the desk and thought, God could have left me in my sins. And it would have been righteous, just, and perfectly fair for him to do so. What an arrogant fool I have been to scoff at the idea that God is really God. That he really is sovereign. That he really is the king of everything. And yet, God in his incredible patience and love changed that. And by his grace alone, made me, made me teachable. Made me look at these passages that used to bother me so much. Used to bug me so much. And uh, changed all that. Changed all that for me. L listen to the last sentence here again from, the can from Article 6. This decision, the wicked, God's decision of who he's going to save and who he's going to bypass and leave justly in their sins. This decision... The wicked, impure, and unstable distort to their own ruin. But see the part I've highlighted? But it provides holy and godly souls with comfort beyond words. That's true. It used to bother me. Now it is the sovereignty of God that keeps me sane. In the midst of trials, in the midst of hardship, seasons of doubt, mm -hmm. sin, difficult stuff that I, that I go through um sorry someone's texting me <clears throat> getting getting more on the grocery list here i need to get from for the uh, the uh, uh from the grocery store um it it provides us with comfort beyond words comfort beyond anything that's even describable god being god used to bother me now man i'll tell you once once life has kind of tripped you a few times and kind of smashed your dreams a little bit and crushed your soul and given you some sleepless months of life. Um, I tell you, if I didn't believe God was sovereign, um, I don't know that I'd be able to continue living. I don't know if I would have it in me to to keep going. I remember a, a Reformed theologian once said, if I actually thought open theism was true, I'd probably just kill myself. The idea that God is not in charge, that God has no idea what he's doing, that God is as surprised by my hardships as I am, um, I'm not going to worship a pathetic deity like that. God measures out our sadness. God measures out our trials. God designs them all for our good and for his glory. It provides ho holy and godly souls with comfort beyond words. Praise God for unconditional election. Irresistible grace is one of the most beautiful phrases I know. <laughs> Irresistible grace. When God goes after the person he wants to get, he never fails. They cannot resist him any more than Lazarus could resist coming back to life I mean when Jesus stood outside the tomb of Lazarus and said Lazarus Lazarus come forth could Lazarus have said eh 
I don't want to. No, Lazarus could neither resist nor assist because Lazarus was dead. Just like us. You who were dead in your transgressions and sins, he made alive. We didn't make ourselves alive by exercising our free will. We believed the gospel because God first made us alive. God opened our eyes first. God resurrected our dead souls first. Okay, pressing on here. Article 7, election. This one. Election or choosing is God's unchangeable purpose by which he did the following. Very important biblical theological truths here. Before the foundation of the world, by sheer grace, according to the free good pleasure of his will, he chose in Christ to salvation a definite number of particular people out of the entire human race. Okay, I want to stop there just for a moment. The reason they're saying that, and we're going to see this in the rejection of errors in this section, this is going to take long. I'm not going to be able to get through this whole point in, in one hour. Actually, how, how much time has elapsed here? Woo, 50 minutes. Good grief. 51 minutes. <clears throat> the reason it's saying he chose in Christ to salvation a definite number of particular people, the reason they're saying that is because even to this day, there's this idea that, well, God chooses the category. He chooses Christ, and then people by their free will get into Christ. God elects the category, but not individual believers. God elects to save those who believe. That's What they're saying here is God elected people by name, individually, from all eternity. Election is not of a faceless, nameless class of people, but rather individuals. A, he chose in Christ to salvation a definite number of particular people out of the entire human race, which had fallen by its own fault from its original innocence into sin and ruin. Those chosen were neither better nor more deserving than the others, but lay with them in the common misery. See what they're, they're trying to make sure everyone understands here? There is no antecedent prompting of God's love. Why does God choose to save one over another? He is absolutely sovereign in it. And it is not based upon anything he saw in us. It is not based on anything other his good pleasure. That doesn't mean it's random. It's not like, well, you know, God threw the dice and decided he was going to save this one, but not that one. That's not how it works. God's electing grace is always, the, the way the scripture describes it, according to his purpose. That doesn't mean random. That's not fate either. It's according to his purpose. But we know it is not because of anything in us. Those chosen were neither better nor more deserving than the others, but lay with them in the common misery. What is the difference between myself and someone who ends up in hell? The five-letter word, grace. Grace. Why does one person go to heaven and another goes to hell? The one that goes to heaven goes because of grace. The one who ends up in hell goes because of fairness and justice. We're not better. We lay with everyone else in the common misery. That's why the idea of an arrogant, smug Christian that looks down their nose at others and thinks they're better than others... Does that person even understand what grace means? I think one of the reasons we don't see a lot of deep repentance is because we, people don't preach this anymore. These doctrines have been lost in the evangelical church at large. I mean, when was the last time you heard a really powerful sermon on, on unconditional electing grace? And yet our Reformed forefathers saw this as saving the Reformation, as grace worth fighting for. It was worth the fight. To, to safeguard what had been so gloriously recovered in the Reformation. It continues here. He did this in Christ, whom he also appointed from eternity to be the mediator, the head of all the chosen, and the foundation of their salvation. And so he decided to give the chosen ones to Christ to be saved, and to call and draw them effectively into Christ's fellowship through his word and spirit. In other words, he decided to grant them true faith in Christ, to justify them, to sanctify them, and finally, after powerfully preserving them in the fellowship of his Son, to glorify them. What part of this is left to the autonomy of man? Praise God, none. If any of it was left to us, I promise you, we would mess it up. We would. And that's why we say our salvation is entirely by grace alone. God did this in order to demonstrate his mercy to the praise of the riches of his glorious grace. 
and that comes right out of Ephesians uh, chapter one. We'll look more in more detail here at the at the scripture passages. I want to want to go ahead and pull that up there here for you though. A passage of scripture that um, is wonderful, wonderful, glorious stuff. Ephesians one. <clears throat> Uh, we'll look at verse, uh, back up to he, verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Why, why did he predestine us to adoption? To glorify his grace. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. What, what does he mean by the beloved? Who, that's Jesus. That's Christ. Remember what, what uh, God the Father said at, at Jesus' baptism? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You realize, of course, God can't say that about me or you or any human being. But we're in Christ. We're hidden in Christ. He is pleased with us because he's pleased with Christ, his son. He predestines us. He chooses us. We are the direct object of his choosing. If you look back at Ephesians 1 verse 4, just as he chose us. So many people have tried to say, yeah, no, 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 he chose Christ. And then we get into Christ by our free will. But that, it doesn't say that. The direct object of the verb to choose here is the word us. He chose us. Definite people elected by name individually from all eternity to be predestined to adoption to the kind, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Why does God choose to save us? To glorify his grace. That's why he does it. Okay, so continuing on here, starting here, or excuse me, or on, this, on this line here. As scripture says, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that's Ephesians, the passage I just read to you, so that we should be holy and blameless before him with love. He predestined us, whom he adopted as his children through Jesus Christ in himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, by which he freely made us pleasing to himself in his beloved. And elsewhere, those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. And that's Romans chapter 8, verse 30. Isn't that glorious stuff? Glorious, glorious, glorious stuff. Let's put that in this context here. We'll put a, a bookmark here and we'll pick up at Article 8. I'm going to highlight this so I remember where we were. I'll put a bookmark in it there. And I'm going to uh, finish off our time here looking at the golden chain here in, in Romans chapter 8. Uh, many people can quote Romans 8, uh, 28, and rightly so from memory, because it's a great verse to, um, to cling to in your moments of, of trial and hardship. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called ones, it says, the, the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, and notice it is the individuals themselves, the people who are foreknown, not what they would do, not that they would, if given a chance, would believe in Jesus. Or anything. It's the individuals that are foreknown. It's people who are foreknown, not their actions. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And that means we're going to suffer, we're going to go through hardship, we're going we're to be carried through the fire and the water to burn off dross and doubt and unbelief, and we're going to have dreams that are crushed and shattered, and God's going to pull us through it, and he's going to make us better through it, and he's going to make us spiritually larger and, and spiritual giants by carrying us through hard things just as his son went through hard things. We're going to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren and these whom he predestined he also called that's the effectual call of god that is the irresistible effectual gracious call of god and we'll look at that in great detail in scripture here later and those whom he called he also justified and these whom he justified he also glorified verse 30 isn't that glorious the golden chain it cannot be broken Every single individual that's foreknown, and that term, uh, prognosco, it means to love beforehand. It means to enter into a relationship with beforehand. Everyone that God chose in Christ before the foundation of the world, he will call them, justify them, and glorify them. And I love verse 31. What shall we say to these things? Think about all the things that people have said in response to the doctrines of sovereign, unconditional electing grace. Well, People have been debating about that for centuries. Is that what we should say in response to that? 
well, there's good men on both sides. There's good scholars on both sides. They don't agree. We're never going to, ne no one is going to solve the, the, the debate over predestination and free will. Is that what Paul says? What shall we say to the fact that God predestines us to eternal life, to faith, to calling, justification, sanctification? Jesus said in John 8, or John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. He predestines us to believe. That's what coming to Christ means. He predestines us to faith in Christ. All that the Father gives me will come to me. He glorifies them. What shall we say to these things? Look at what it says. If God is for us, who is against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Think about that. No judicial charge of wrongdoing will ever be brought against me because Jesus bore the wrath against my sins at the cross. He has redeemed me from my lawless transgressions and all my sins. He has redeemed me from the law's curse so that I have peace with God. God is the one who justifies. Who is he who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, was also raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. That is one of the clearest statements of limited atonement, of particular redeeming grace in the whole Bible. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? No one can bring a charge against God's elect because Christ Jesus died. He was raised. He's at the right hand of God. He intercedes for us. He intercedes for us. What is the antecedent of the pronoun us? The elect. God's elect. Why will no charge be brought against us? God is justified. Who? The elect. He intercedes for. The elect. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who is the us? The elect. Those foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing. Nothing. Tribulation, distress, persecution, Famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we're being put to death daily, all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We overwhelmingly conquer, says the New American Standard, through him who loved us. For I am convinced. You know, some translations render that as persuaded, but the, the uh, verb there means convinced. I am convinced. I hold it to be a fact. Neither death, nor life, angels, principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. I don't care if the coronavirus kills three-fourths of the population of this country. Nothing in the future. Nothing to come. Nor powers, height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's security. So come what may, if God is for me, it can be against me. What can happen? What can separate me from the love of God in Christ? Nothing. Nothing. Praise his holy name. Well, I tried to keep it under an hour. I did a little preaching there. Um, you, you feel the need to preach when you've prepared a sermon. I didn't even prepare a sermon on this topic. But you can't help it when you read about it. Um, so I'll be doing a lot of preaching into these videos. Uh, and I would encourage you all to, to have your Bibles uh, ready so you can follow along on the passages. I'll, the, the, I think I made the font big enough for you to be able to follow on this way. So we'll stop um, at Article 8. Just so see here. Yeah, Article 8. Under the first heading. Man, we're not even to the, to the rejection of errors. There's all kinds of ways you can get this wrong. Um, but the Canons of Dort is wonderful. It's a great document. Um... You can follow along this way. I've got copies of it here at church, but um, I guess we really can't, you can't come to church yet. Uh, we, we, we really do want to take this seriously. We want to be uh, faithful. We don't want anyone to get sick who has a compromised immune system. We don't want to spread it. But what a blessing to have the technology. It's because of, of God's grace to man and man's ability to, to take dominion and to subdue the created order that we have this kind of technology, that we can still, in a sense, have this contact with each other. So... If you have any questions or anything you'd like me to address uh, in videos, I'm happy to do that. You know, send me an email, uh, pwhines at gmail.com, um, pwhines at gmail.com. Uh, you can email me there if you have questions you'd like me to address in videos. I'm glad to do that for the church. 
Um, and uh, I really miss everybody. Uh, I miss you all. Um, thankful that we have our prayer chain, that we can still pray for each other. And, uh, you know, when we get back together in church again, it's going to be a real celebration. It's going to be an emotional thing <laughs> to be able to get back together in our in our church when this passes. And, and it will pass eventually. Um, but hope this was, was helpful to people. I can think of nothing I love to think about or meditate on or read about more <laughs> than the grace of God. The sovereign grace of God um, to save his people from their sins. It's wonderful stuff. It's uh, it's medicine to the soul. It's a salve for the soul in, in, this, in the midst of weird, strange times. And it's the kind of thing that we can know. God will have his people believing long after we're dead and buried. And, and God has raised up new people uh, to believe and, and propagate these wonderful truths. Uh, so I love you all. I miss you all. And um, I'll try to do another video tomorrow um, to press on from Article 8 here. So this is Pastor Patrick signing off. Uh, thanks for listening or for watching.